But let me do some review before we jump into these scriptures because I've been in this for three weeks now. And, um, you know, today Carla was going to minister, but that's okay. I had all my material in this message anyway because I only got through lesson one last week. So I've got my material for this week, and God knows what he's doing. But we've been talking about biblical lessons uh, from the wilderness. And what I'm using is the story of the children of Israel's exodus out of Egypt through the wilderness before they finally take possession of the promised land. Now, it was a pretty long journey. It didn't go as planned. The Lord wanted them in the wilderness for about 11 days, and they ended up taking an 11-day journey and stretching it out to 40 years. During the time that they were in the wilderness, whether it was during those 11 days, whether it was when they arrived to the borders, and we're going to talk about this today, the promised land, and they had to send spies in to investigate the land to see if it was as God said it was going to be, or if it was the 40 years that they wandered around the wilderness and um, was disobedient to the Lord. There's a lot of lessons, church family, that we can learn from their journey and apply it to our life today. Because whether it's a promise that the Lord has given to you, a scripture that you're standing on, something you're praying for, something you're believing for, or, it is, uh, or if it's in alignment with your purpose and your destiny, which is what the promised land really represents. All of us can develop some of these similar mindsets that will hold us back from fulfilling what God's called us to do. It can delay the promise. It can also hinder our prayers. Who's with me today? Come on. And so we're using this journey, these biblical lessons from the wilderness. Let's go ahead and put up the opening. Can we do that, Susan? That opening lesson that we laid the groundwork with the first week we were here. It's an opening truth, I think, uh, is what we had. The wilderness can be a powerful and positive experience. Everything you go through, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy when you fall into divers. Trials or temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith is developing something in you. It's patience. And then in First Peter, it talks about the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes. So there's some powerful things that God wants to do in you. You've got to understand, it's in the wilderness God is developing you for the next level that you're supposed to be at. That open door you're getting ready to walk through. Those things that God is wanting to reveal to you. The wilderness is a place of preparation. And with that opening truth, I stated that the wilderness is not, is not supposed to be a lifelong place of residence, but just a temporary dwelling place in your way to the next level in your walk with the Lord. Amen? But the problem is, is we get these mindsets, we get these attitudes, and it hinders our ability from moving forward. The first was what we talked about last week. And uh, let's go ahead and put that up. Is that in there? Lesson number one. Last week we talked about focusing on the past and not the future. That's a biggie. And I think that was a good lesson to begin with because when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, what did they keep doing every time things got tough? We want to go back to Egypt. Are you kidding me? You mean back to the place that for 400 years you were slaves? And you had to work tiresome hours upon hours and day upon day. And... Uh, you had to do all this building and you had to go through all this and the food was horrible. And just because you're going through some tough times, you want to go back to Egypt? Are you kidding me? It's amazing how it happens to us. We go through a tough time and then we go back to the way things were in the past. And so we talked about that last week. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's even the good things that we've been through. You see that happen a lot in churches. We talk about the glory days. We talk about when a former pastor or a former member or a former family or a former ministry. Or do you remember when this happened? I wish we can go back. I, I remember when I first got saved, and I'd been saved for a couple of years. And this little country church I was attending, if the church service was dead, the worship team, the, the lead singer would turn around and look at the piano player and there was one song in particular. If we sing that song, God's going to come. Because that one service that we were here, man, we sang that song and a revival broke out. And so every time things got dead in the church service, the worship leader would turn around the piano player and go. And she'd say, play Our God Reigns. How many remember that song from the early 90s? Our God Reigns. Who remembers that song? Yeah, that was the go-to song. Because why? Because six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, 
God moved in service with that song. And so anytime the worship service got dead, let's pull it up. Now that was in the days that we had clear transparencies on an overhead projector. I remember those days in church. How many of you don't know what I'm talking about when I say overhead projector with those clear transparencies? Who in here, when you were younger, that was your job? You flipped the transparent. Let me see your hands. Come on. Yeah. Listen, I remember back in the day, when I got here in 2001, we didn't have projectors. We had walls over here. Right here, there were walls, and there were a couple of offices. We never really used them. They were kind of a catch-all room. But... um, now they're in other rooms, but they were here back then. And so we had walls. And see, we had a screen here. It was an electric screen. And we pulled it up. You remember? The and we had an overhead projector about right here where Timmy's at. And it was an old wooden file. And it didn't even have wheels on it when I first got here. And you talk about cramp. There was no room up here. And um, my oldest son, Josh, that was his job. Because he sat up here with me as the pastor. And you'd have those clear transparencies. And, of course, me with excellence, I was like, no handwritten transparencies. No handwritten. It's all got to come off. I want it to look good. Because you'd have some people writing and they'd misspell words. And, you know, that just didn't look so well. So that was back in the day. So for some of you younger people, we got technology in churches. Um, y'all are blessed. Because, <laughs> man, that was tough. And then you'd sing a song and persons going through the files, they can't find it. They can't find it. And, and, you know, and we can't sing if we can't see the lyrics on the screen. You know how that is. Isn't that amazing? We sing a new song or the lyrics aren't up on the screen and we feel like we can't worship. Oh, where was I at? Amen. The mindset of staying on the past and not the future. Well, today I want to talk about a mindset that is a plague in the church. And let's put it up here. Mindset number two, laziness. You mean there's lazy people in church? Yeah, not not you, not you, not anybody here today. Um, Those are the families that have left in the past. That's that church around the corner. They're the ones that are lazy. What do I mean by a lazy mindset? This is, this, is, this is the mindset. It is the somebody else do it for me attitude. And see, the children of Israel got caught in this in the wilderness. The Lord required obedience and he required faith. He required boldness. When the spies were sent in and they looked at the land and they saw the giants. And God said, don't look at the giants. It's amazing that they had to send spies to begin with. Why did they have to send spies when the Lord said, the land's yours? So that was their first act of unbelief. Well, we better better send some spies in. And and they came back and they said, how was the land? The spies, it's exactly as God said. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Grapes the size of, of basketballs. Here they are. And here's a cluster. The Bible says they brought back. The fruit of the land. And here it is. It's exactly as God said. Praise God. And then somebody negative had to slide in. They said, yeah, but there's some giants in the land. There's some giants. And, and um, I don't know if we're able. Matter of fact, the wording, King James says, we be not able to go in and take what God promised us. And so what happened? They began to cry and they began to moan and they began to groan because they had to go through some giants to take possession of what the Lord had for them. And this is what basically they were saying. Somebody do it for me. God, do this for me. This is basically what they were saying. God, would you go in and take those giants out? God, will you make things easy for me? I know that it's going to require faith and whatsoever is not a faith is sin. And I know that stepping out of the boat, you know, when the apostle Peter had to step out of the boat, Jesus said, listen, you just come to me. And as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he walked on the water. And what happened when he got his eyes on the winds and the waves? What happened? He sank. It's this lazy mindset. Somebody else do it. And really, a lot of times when it's us that needs to just step out in faith and be obedient to the Lord. God, will you take care of this for me? Lord, will you take care of this giant? Lord, will you take care of this trial? Come on. How many times did we have something that we knew we were going to have to go through during the week and we just wished that God would just take care of it so we wouldn't have to go through it? Amen. 
I don't want to go through that meeting. I don't want to have to get that phone call. I don't want to have to deal with this. I don't want to have to sit down with my boss at work. I don't want to have to meet the principal at school concerning my child. I don't want to have to do any of these things. I don't want to have to go file my taxes because I know what the tax man's going to say. And this is what we do. We expect God to just miraculously just take. And can God? Yes, he can. Can God eliminate a lot of those things? And for some of your lives, God's done it that way. But the problem is God doesn't always choose to do it that way. Usually the Lord says, you know, you need to step in yourself. I'll go with you. I'll give you boldness. I'll give you wisdom. I'll anoint you. But this situation, you're going to have to go through it yourself. You're going to delay your purpose. You're going to delay answered prayer if you take the lazy approach and expect someone else to do it for you. And so this holds us back. Because you've got to understand, usually in life, we don't avoid the fire. We go through the fire. God doesn't have us go around the wilderness. He allows us to go through it and commands that we go through it. But it's through our faith in him that during the time we go through the fire in the wilderness, God provides, God anoints, God blesses, God gives wisdom. And then when everything is over, it's meant to increase your faith. Amen. If God removed every problem from your life, where would your faith be? Where would your maturity be? If the Lord said, I want you to do this for the kingdom, but it's going to require some faith on your part. You're going to have to step out of the boat. You don't see where your foot's going to land, but just trust me. You're going to be able to walk all over this situation. But you've got to be obedient. Obedience requires works. And that's what James says. He says, faith without works is dead. So if we say we're going to believe, we still got to move forward. If we say we're going to believe, we still got to deal with things in our life that are uncomfortable. But along the way, if we can just trust... We won't stay in the wilderness. We got too many people who've parked it in the wilderness because they do not want to be obedient to what God called them to do. It's going to take too much work. Somebody else do it for me. I don't want to take responsibility. See, bottom line, this point is all about responsibility. I know that word's kind of a cuss word to people <laughs> when you talk to them in church. Pastor, I, I feel I'm called, man. I, I'm, I'm called by God. You know, through, through the years, so many times people have come to me, Pastor, I'm, I'm called by God, you know, to the ministry. Do you understand if you're called to the ministry, it's going to require a little bit more obedience? Oh, yeah, I understand. You know, we're much just giving much. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I tell you what, just be faithful to church and be faithful in your giving and be faithful to church events. And, uh, you know, everybody wants to win the world, but they don't want to stack chairs after a church event. <laughs> They don't want to help clean up. They don't want to help show up early. They don't want to come to prayer meeting. But man, they want to shake the world for Jesus. You know, it's amazing how many times I've given that counsel to somebody and uh, the Lord's just led them somewhere else after the counsel. The Israelites didn't want the responsibility to go in. The Israelites didn't want the responsibility to have to go in and take what God promised to them. They wanted God to kill the giants. And they wanted God to prove to them that he was God. And then they would go in after God already took care of the situation. Church family, that's not how life works. That's not how ministry works. That's not how fulfilling your purpose works. You know, before I got up here to preach this message, I had to be prepared in what I was preaching Oh, sure, I could have said, you know what, Lord, when I get up behind that pulpit, I'm going to carry my Bible with me, and, and you just speak through me. Lord, you just do this. You take over, and you take responsibility. And I understand that we can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. I understand that, and I know that it's not me, but it's Christ in me. And I know that it's His grace and His empowerment giving me the ability to do what He's called me to do. But I'm the one that has to be obedient first and take the responsibility that goes along with the calling. And then when I take the first step, God takes care of me in the second step. If the Israelites would have just went in and not been fearful for the giants and just understood after all... All those days that God proved he was there for them. I mean, my goodness, they witnessed the splitting of the Red Sea. They witnessed the most powerful army in the world drowned by the Red Sea. 
And they couldn't go in and take the promised land for a few giants that were there. It takes obedience. It takes faith. It takes action on your part. See, faith partners with the commands of God. Let me say that again. Faith partners with the commands of God. It carries out knowing that what God promised, it's going to happen in the end, but we're the ones that have to take that step of obedience. Basically, it's an attitude of responsibility. Responsibility understands God has went before us. Amen. Come on. God has went before us, but we're the ones that have to, by faith, walk in obedience, even when sight doesn't see the answer, even when our emotions are telling us everything contrary, we're going to be obedient. We're going to take the responsibility for what God called us to do. And when we take that step of faith, God will meet us and our faith partners with the command of God. Does that make sense? Responsibility. Let's break this down. Responsibility says I'm responsible for where I am in life. And I can't blame anybody else. You do realize that's what it boils down to. If things don't go well and things don't go to, to plan, we play the victim. We're the victim. Well, if so-and-so wouldn't have done this, if so-and-so wouldn't have said this, if so-and-so wouldn't have persecuted me. Oh, you mean that individual is more powerful than what God commanded you to do? So, so you mean a person can hold back what God's will is in your life? Only if you let that person, and the way you let that person is when you give excuses and give more power to the person that attacked or persecuted than what they deserve. Are y'all listening to me? In the book of Daniel, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were commanded with everybody else in Babylon, they said, you're going to bow down to the image of Nebuchadnezzar when it goes through. Everybody's going to bow down. And when the image went through... Everybody bowed down except those three young Hebrew boys. And this is what they said when when they came to them and they said, Oh, you're not going to bow down to the image? Fine, we're going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And what was their response? You go ahead and throw us in the fiery furnace. Because you know what? If God doesn't save us, that's all right. He's still going to be with us anyway. We're not bowing down. By faith, we're going to worship God and not this image. And what happened? God rewarded their faith. God rewarded their no compromise attitude. We all know the story. They threw open the furnace. They put in the three young Hebrews. The people that threw them in burned up because the fire was so strong. And they didn't burn up. And the people that were looking in the furnace, what did they say? I still see them. They're in there and they're moving. And we see someone else in there who looks like the son of God. And when they they rescued rescued them out of the furnace, they didn't even smell like smoke. We all know the story. But it took faith. It took obedience. It took responsibility. It took a no compromise attitude. And that's what responsibility says. This is my destiny. This is my calling. And if I don't follow God's direction, and if I don't obey God's commands, then I will not see it fulfilled. I won't compromise my responsibility. Come on, who's in here with me today? See, there's no better time than today to set goals for your life. The longer we delay or postpone those goals, the longer it is before they're achieved. Never forget where you are today as a result of the goals that you started somewhere and sometime in the past. The things that you're enjoying today is because you took responsibility for where you are in life. You got rid of the victim mentality. You didn't try to shrug it off on somebody else to do for you what you're supposed to be doing yourself. You didn't play the blame game. You didn't, and you didn't even blame Satan. You didn't blame people. You didn't blame circumstances. You took the responsibility. That's where you are. So what are those goals? What about your walk with the Lord? Your prayer time? Your study of God's Word? Getting committed to church? Getting busy with your kingdom purpose? Those are goals that you set. And if anything stands in the way from you receiving direction from God and seeing the fulfillment of what God commanded you to do, if it's not happening, you can't blame anybody. Come on, I know we don't want, especially in today's society, I know we don't want to hear this. 
Especially, you know, and I'm not picking on young people, but generations that are now being raised, things are so, listen, things are so much easier. We were laughing in the foyer before church, and we were talking about cap and gown. And, uh, and then I said, senior key. Who remembers senior keys? I graduated in the 80s, so I remember seeing. Babe, did you have a senior key? Okay, maybe it was just an Indiana thing. I don't know. Yeah, it is. So, so, anyway, <laughs> we, we got a memo. How many remember getting the memo, getting the memo in your, uh, in your junior year, and uh, you get the memo, and they let you know all these things that are getting ready to happen your senior year. We don't want class ring. They don't need, do people get class rings anymore? It's, they still got class rings. But I remember before my senior year, Cap, gown, senior trip, senior key, senior pictures, class ring. And I remember mom and dad, you're going to pay for it. (laughs) What? You got a job? Yeah, you're paying for it. I was the youngest of three, all one year apart. Boom, boom, boom. I'd pay for it. I mean, I remember when I got my driver's license and I got a job working at the local video store. And uh, dad was like, you want a car? I was like, yeah. He said, "Uh, you're going to pay for it. I didn't even pick out my first car. I didn't even pick out my first car. My first car was a Mercury Zephyr. Had a Ford engine, Rick. And that was a good car. That was a good car. I had a slant six. I ran that thing in the ground. Never took care of it. And uh, it, it never broke down on me. I was good. I was, I, was always the, the, I was always the taxi, too. You know how it is when you're the guy in school, you're the one with the vehicle, nobody else got a vehicle, and you're the one that's got to do all the driving. But I, my dad, I remember I was, I was sitting there in English Video, which was the video store I was working at, and dad pulled up, brown, two-door, I hated the color, I hated the car, and dad said, I went looking for you, and this is what I found, this is what will work in your budget, this is the car you're getting. There was no, yeah, but I want, you know. I was lucky it had air conditioning, and it did work. And it wasn't a stick shift. My second car was a stick shift, but my first car was automatic. So, man, I felt blessed by my dad. So I had to do it all. I had to be responsible for it all. You want a car, you pay for it. Get a job. You want this, you pay for it. My mom did give me lunch money. But if I wanted anything above what normal basic lunch paid for, it's on you. You want extra fries, you're paying for it. Come on, why is it so silent in here today? I'm talking about responsibility. It's because I'm talking about responsibility, isn't it? Responsibility. We don't like that word, but when it comes to the kingdom, you better be responsible. I know I've learned after 26 years of pastoring, there's nobody else out there that's going to do what I'm supposed to do for the kingdom. Now, I understand delegation. I understand we work together as a church family. That's a whole other lesson. But when it comes to what I'm called to do, when it comes to stepping through that door and being obedient, having to walk by faith, having to do things I don't want to do, having to make decisions I don't want to make, having to do things that's against my emotions or my feelings, I've got to be responsible to be obedient to what God called me to do and understand that it's through my actions and through my works that it partners with God's command and God will bless my responsible attitude. So you want more prayer time? Make time. You want to study God's word? Make time. You want to be committed to church? Make time. You want to get busy with your kingdom purpose? Make time and be responsible. Don't blame the devil. Don't blame things. you hear some of the excuses I've heard through the years. I'm not even going to go down through the list today. Well, how about life goals? How about life goals? Come on. Anybody here want to lose weight, get in shape? Come on, God's not going to smack that Baconator out of your hand. God, if you don't want me to eat this, knock it out of my hand. And God doesn't knock it out of your hand. Well, I guess, God, I'm going to eat it. No, you're the one. You're the one that's got to discipline your schedule. And it hurts when you exercise, especially when you hit 50. It's not convenient. It hurts. 
But if you set a goal, you're the one that's got to be the one that, that carries it out. How about finishing your degree? I mean, I'm sitting back and I'm watching my wife at the age of 50. She's finishing her doctorate. A lot of sleepless nights. There's a lot of things she's got to do. She's got to go out to residency. She's got to deal with video conferencing. She's got to do all this. She's got to do all those things. Nobody's going to do it for her. And I ain't doing it for her. Because I don't know what she's doing. So you set a goal. I want to eat right. I want to lose weight. I want to finish my degree. I want to declutter my home, my basement, my garage. I want to get my yard landscape. Nobody's going to do it for you. So those are life goals, and you've got to be responsible. Every single goal that we, that we try to set forward in our life, and especially kingdom goals that we know God has spoken to us, can only be achieved through our obedience. We cannot put off and tell tomorrow what we know we need to do today. And for some of you that are enjoying today the fruit of some of that diligence and some of that hard work, think back if you'd have never started the journey. Come on. Some of you finishing your degree. And we got some people here in our church that, that finished, and Yvonne finished hers last year. Dr. Jones. Amen. Now, now, what have happened? And Loren, you, you started your journey with your master's, right? So, so, so think about this. If you didn't start the journey and you sit here today and you're like, man, I sure went. And then you sit back and you're like, man, if I'd have started that three or four years ago, I'd have already be finished. Come on, are you with me? And that's what happens with responsibility. It's funny, we see, I see people get saved and they'll come into church and, and I'll see somebody that's been saved for a few years and the person that's younger is more diligent. They're, they're more hungry for God. Show up to prayer, show up to church, worship, willing to do anything. Man, I'll stack chairs if I need. And, and they end up growing and surpassing the other person that's been saved for years. And they're walking with the Lord. And they sit back and they're like, well, it must be nice. It's like y'all had the same opportunity. Amen. Y'all had the same opportunity to just be responsible and let the Lord bless your labor. But this person took advantage of it. This person wasn't going to look back at their life and say, man, I wish two years ago I'd have done this, or five years ago, or ten years ago I'd have done this. You think after 40 years, the Israelites probably sat back and thought, man, if we would have just went in and not griped about those giants in the land, we wouldn't have had to have done this for 40 years. 40 years! Every single one of these goals that I just mentioned can only be achieved by not putting off until somewhere in the future what should have been started days, weeks, months, or even years ago. So the next time you see somebody else enjoying the fruit of their hard work, just remember that you could be the one enjoying that same fruit if you wouldn't have delayed your goal and took responsible attitudes and said, you know what, I'm going to be responsible. With God's help, I'll reach my destiny. I'm willing to pay the price. Basically, responsibility doesn't want to be lazy and doesn't want to have to constantly rely on other people and constantly give excuses about what the devil's done and what other people have done. All the giants in the land, I be not able. Responsibility says if God's blessings and promises are not being manifested in my life, it is because I'm hindering the manifestation, me. Nobody else but me. And the only thing that's happening in my life, it's happened because I've allowed it or I wasn't walking in faith and trusting God to help me plow through it to achieve it. This is the attitude that's found in a lot of people in church who want to enjoy the land of promise without doing what it's going to take to get there. Let me say that again. Come on, it's quiet in here. It's the lack of sleep, right? It's that extra hour you lost. So many people, and I've seen it in all the years I've been in church, I've seen it in ministry, people want to enjoy the land of promise. I want the windows of heaven to open. I want a double portion of God's anointing. I want giftings. I want manifestations. I want revelation. I want to enjoy the land of God's abundance. But I'm not willing to do what it's going to take to get there. We got too many people in church that uh, instead of having a backbone, they got a wishbone.
Let me, let me tell you, as somebody that's been doing ministry for a few years now, you want to accomplish what God's called you to do. You want to get to the level God wants you to be at. You want to fulfill your purpose. And that way, when you stand before the Lord, you hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Then guess what? You're going to have to be well done. And you're going to have to be a good and faithful servant. You won't hear those words if that's not who you are. And it will take a backbone. You're going to have to receive criticism from people who don't understand what God spoke to your heart. There's times you're going to have to let your circle become tighter and tighter and tighter. There's times you're going to have to see everybody else enjoying life when you're like, I'm at home praying because the Lord wants me to fast. There's going to be times that when the church service is over and everybody shoots out the door there in their car, there at Longhorn, before you can say boo. And you're sitting around in church. Yeah, I got to stick around because I got a teacher's meeting today. And Wednesday church service, everybody gets to go home and the worship team stays. Yeah, see, there's going to be times that you're going to have to make sacrifices to do what God's called you to do. There's going to be times that the Lord's going to want you to go above and beyond what just an average churchgoer can do. And we look at that and we're like, Lord, how come that can't be me? How come I'm the one that's got to give more? How come I'm the one that has to sacrifice more? How come I, you know what? Listen, if you love God and you want to fulfill your purpose, it's going to take a backbone. It's going to take bravery. It's going to take faith. You're going to have to deal with persecution. You're going to have to deal with devils putting a target on you. You know what it's like to be a pastor when you've got the biggest target, bigger than anybody else in the church? It's not fun. It's not fun that when people, if they don't like what's going on in the church, they'll just leave and go to the church down the road. When I'm the one still stuck here as the pastor, have to deal with the fallout and stand in the ashes of decisions somebody else made. But when I said, here am I, God, send me. When I said, I will be there, I will pastor, I will shepherd, I will be there until, Lord, you tell me it's time to go. When most people get upset and they leave, when most people get upset and they'll quit that ministry and they dump all the responsibility on your lap, it takes faith to have to be the person that picks up the pieces. But it's going to be worth it. Your labor is going to be worth it. Your prayers are going to be worth it. Your fasting and your sacrifices is going to be worth it. Because not only are you going to be able to fulfill what God called you to do in this life, but when you stand before Jesus, none of it's going to matter as long as you hear, well done, good and faithful servant. For the short time you were on, on the planet doing what I called you to do, you were willing to seek first the kingdom. You were willing to put my priorities above everybody in your circle. And because of that, before you is treasure you stored up in heaven. And I'm going to tell you, church family, we're going to enjoy that treasure, that treasure for all of eternity. We're going to enjoy the treasure that we stored up in heaven. And I'm telling you, if we got a kingdom mindset, that's where our focus is going to be. I'm storing up treasure in heaven. I'm storing up treasure in heaven. God, I'm just being obedient to you. I'm doing this because I love you, God, even if the, the, the fallout or even if the end result is not what I want it to be. I'm doing it because I love you, Jesus. And I'm doing it because that's what you've destined me and purposed me on this planet to do and to accomplish. I'm doing it for you, Jesus. Believe me, when you stand before Jesus and you fall at his feet because you see him face to face and you see those nail-scarred hands, and you see the scar on his brow from that crown of thorns. And you see the one that died for you, the one that created you, the one that answered your prayers and was forever making intercession for you, the one that was there for you when you didn't think he was there, and the times when you didn't believe him, believed more in you than you did in him. When you stand before him and you fall at his feet, when you see his glory, and you hear his words echo through all eternity, well done. You were faithful over a few. Therefore, I'm going to make you ruler over much. 
You know what's amazing, and I had this conversation the other day with somebody. What's amazing is when you put the kingdom first, it's amazing how God just takes care of everything. It's like, wow, where'd that time come from? Where'd those resources come from? Where'd those finances come from? God honors that because you say, you know what, I'm responsible. And instead of a wishbone, I'm going to take a backbone. See, we say, I wish I was blessed. I wish I was delivered. I wish I was walking. I wish I could complete my purpose like brother, sister, so-and-so. I, I, I wish I could enjoy what brother, sister, so-and-so is enjoying. The lesson is it takes backbone to do what God called us to do. It takes boldness. It takes radical faith, radical obedience, and radical boldness. It takes work. It takes a willingness to grow. It takes a willingness to stand before God and say, Lord, anything in me that's not pleasing to you, I want you to purge it out. Lord, if, if that doesn't give you honor and that doesn't give you glory, Lord, speak it. It might be tough. I might have to crucify my flesh. I might have to purge that thorn. And even like you said, if it's hindering, if my right hand offends me, I might have to cut it off in my right eye offends you pluck it out and it's going to take discipline but it's worth it because I want to walk in the land of promise I want to walk in the land of promise I want to receive a greater revelation of Jesus now than I've ever had in my lifetime I want to walk in the same anointing the great men and women of God that I study about and read about in scripture and through historical books I want that. I want to see what they saw. I want to witness what they witnessed. I want to see those miracle signs and wonders. I want to fulfill the calling of God on my life to where I could wake up every single day and be at peace knowing I've laid it all out on the table. No hidden sins. No bad attitudes. No blame games. No victim mentality. I've laid it all out on the table. God, I give you all of me. Nothing, I'm holding nothing back. It takes a willingness to not only plant, but to prepare the harvest by the hard work of cultivating every seed that we've sown. Maturity is doing what's right and working hard when no one is looking and we get no credit for what we've done privately. God understands that in the end, by faith, it'll speak. Am I, making any, am I speaking to anybody in here today? Proverbs chapter 6, I'll end off this. Preaching longer than what I thought. Wow, that's a big revelation. <laughs> Preaching longer than I thought. It's only 11. You ever wonder why they don't do the time change on Sunday night instead of Saturday night? It's not fair to all of us pastors. It's because they'd rather have people late for church or not show up to church than show up to work. So I get it. I get it. But if y'all was here for intercessory prayer at 7 this morning, you wouldn't be. Anyway, Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 6. I love you guys. <laughs> Go to the ant, you sluggard, and consider her ways, and be wise. Which having no guide, or overseer, or ruler, verse 8, provides her meat in the summer, and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you sleep? O oh, sluggard, when will thou arise out of thy sleep? Verse 10, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. That's delaying, by the way. Delaying until tomorrow or next week or next month, what we know we should be doing now. Delaying our obedience. Verse 11, so shall thy poverty come on one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. Let's go back to verse 6 again real quick. We'll break this down and we'll close. When you look up the word sluggard, it means in the Hebrew, slothful, lazy. Now get this, this is in the Hebrew. To rely or lean on others. 
to rely or lean on others. I'm going to make one statement and don't shoot the messenger, okay? I cannot believe what I'm hearing in our country about policies that have destroyed other countries. I cannot believe that people now want the government to pay for everything. Now listen, I'm saying this and you might get mad at me. But we in this generation have developed an attitude that we want the government to take care of us. If the government takes care of you, they control you. If the government, ta- listen to me, if the government takes care of you, they control you. And when this nation was formed, I saw a documentary last month on George Washington. And George Washington came over here, and this is all George Washington wanted. This is all he wanted. He said, I just want Britain to stay off my back. Give me a plot of land. Give me liberty. Give me freedom. And I will pursue. I will pursue it. Just I'll work the land. I'll farm it. I'll be the businessman. I'll develop the deals and the trade deal. Just give me the land. I'll work it. I don't want the government to give it to me. Just give me the freedom to enjoy what's mine. Don't overtax me. Don't control it. And that's why America broke away from Britain's reign. And that's why the Revolutionary War even happened. is because Britain wanted to rule the colonies. And they overtaxed everybody. And they wanted to run everybody's life. And these founding fathers said, we want freedom. We want freedom. If we fail, then we have the freedom to fail. If we succeed, then we have the freedom to succeed. That everybody has an opportunity in this country. And I know my wife doesn't like me to say this, but you got to understand the journey that Mima had coming from Panama and choosing to do things right and become a citizen of this country. And the journey that my wife had, that at the age of 17, bilingual, growing up on Miami, said, you know what, I'm going to join the military. I, it's funny, I want free college. You want free college? Go join the military. And my wife never saw a snowflake. Never saw a snowflake growing up in Miami. Joined the Air Force and was stationed at Grand Forks, North Dakota. Well, they don't measure snow in inches, but in feet. And Joey's father's from Cuba. Mima's from Panama. They know, they knew what it was like to live in countries that wanted to run everything. And if anybody had an excuse... If anybody had an excuse to not do something with with their life, my wife had that excuse. She said, no, I'm going to join the military because God spoke to her and told her to. And throughout her life, she went through the military. She earned her degree, earned two degrees, went through college, worked a job, helped deal with her brother, helped raise her brother. He's in the army now. Still in the army after all those years. She's been a business owner. She's done all of those accomplishments and had nobody. And didn't rely on the government to help see her through. Had everything against her. I hope you don't get mad at me for saying this, but but it's an example. She's a minority female that over 30 years ago, everybody would have said, it won't work. You're a minority female. And Jovi said... Hold my lemonade. (laughs) Ever since I've been here as a pastor, I'm just going, I'm sharing my heart. We've, I probably lost you all anyway, so. I didn't grow up in church. You got to understand in some denominations, um, it's in your favor if you're a second or third generation uh, church of God. Now, I'm first generation. And when I, when I got saved and I got my credentials, I didn't know anybody. I wasn't buddies with anybody on the state council. I didn't know anybody. I, wasn't, I didn't know any pastors. I didn't know any overseers. In the Church of God, if you live in the southeast, kind of where our headquarters is at, and you kind of know the right people, and, and God uses that. I get all that. I didn't have nothing. High school education. I didn't go to college. High school education. Got saved. Accepted the call to ministry. First church I had. 
They shut the doors of the church before I took it. And every step along the way, I, I haven't been able to rely on anybody. I couldn't rely on, hey, my dad's a pastor, my brother's a minister, so-and-so works in the state office in this state, can you do me a favor? I couldn't do that. And every step along the way, I've had to go through pain, I've had to go through darkness, I've had to go through attack, but you know what? I wouldn't trade my journey now. And some of you that have sat back and you said, I know exactly what you're talking about, Pastor, because I've had to work for everything. Some of you in here, you get up early every single day and you feel like that you wonder, when am I ever going to get ahead? God's blessing you and God is honoring that and God is going to honor your faith and your discipline and your responsibility. You stay in your own lane. You don't worry about somebody else's life. You don't compare your life to somebody else and say, I wish I had the path they had. You stay in your lane and you just obey God. Am I making any sense in here? All I've ever known, listen, all I've ever known is hard work. That's all I've ever known. From the time I had to get my first job and pay for my own car and pay for my insurance and pay for my cap and gown and class ring and, and key and senior trip and all that stuff. That's all I've ever known. And when we choose to be a part of the kingdom, it's going to take work. It's going to take prayer. It's going to take fasting. And it's going to take discipline. And Proverbs 6 says, learn a lesson from the sluggard ant. Slothful, lazy, leaning on, relying on others. Learn a lesson and consider her ways. That even though the ant has no guide, no overseer, no ruler to micromanage and look over her. Basically, it means they have nobody to rely on except God. Chooses to provide meat in the summer and gather her food in the harvest. Looks ahead and chooses not to follow what verse 9 says. Oh, how long are you going to lay down and sleep? You sluggard when you arise out of your sleep. Yet just a little sleep, just a little summer. Slumber, I'll put off until tomorrow what I know I need to do today. A folding of the hands. In the Hebrew, the word hands there means labor, ministry, service, and work. It means it's a posture. It's a, a folding of the hands, it says. Somebody else do it. Come on. No, I ain't doing it. Let somebody else, let the pastor do it all. Let so-and-so do it all. They always volunteer. Proverbs 6 says when we take that posture, when we choose to not walk in faith, when we choose to sit back and blame everybody else, verse 11 says poverty comes on us. And what's that mean? It means that the blessing, the promise, the inheritance, the things that God wants to give us is withheld because we didn't take responsibility. Stand with me.